open to the Gospel of Luke in chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, if you want to open there as well, we'll be in that uh, text here in just a moment. Gavin and Elaine are in Kentucky. Uh, They went to a wedding, I think, uh, there uh, yesterday, and so he told me that they were getting up really early uh, with all the traffic that's supposed to be uh, forecast to come into the state of Arkansas and uh, drive somewhere. I don't remember where and stop for worship this morning. Uh, but they're not here today, so y'all are going to have to put up with me in both the uh, lessons today. But I trust that our time together in the Word of God will be uh, beneficial and helpful to all of us. When the serpent of old, as he is described in Scripture, Satan, our enemy, uh, slithered, slithered up to Eve and started talking to her. God's truth was under assault. And as far as we know, God's truth was under assault for the first time here on earth. And as we live, however long after that, probably thousands of years since that uh, time occurred in the Garden of Eden, God's truth remains under assault today. Our culture as a whole, I think, has come to the point where we are at war with truth. And it's not something that has just happened in the last few years or the last couple of decades, my lifetime or really even your lifetime, but I think our culture, our world at large has been at war with God's truth ever since sin came into the world. And as a result of this war that is going on between us and God and the truth that He has given us, there are lots of bad attitudes toward truth that abound in our world and in our culture today. There are some people who look at truth and would just deny its existence and say, well, you know, you have your truth and I have my truth, or there really is no such thing as truth whatsoever, and just deny that it exists. There are other people who would say, yes, there is perhaps some truth, and yes, they might even acknowledge that there is truth that is given by God our Creator, but they just kind of have the tendency to ignore what God's truth says. It's not really relevant to their life. They could care less what God has said about anything. There are still other people that are living around us who would say, well, I'm not just going to ignore it, but I'm going to actively oppose God's truth. And they have devoted themselves and the rest of their life to getting into a fight with God, basically. And we know from reading Scripture that if you fight against God, you're definitely going to lose. God is always going to win that battle every time. And yet, this is the environment in which we find ourselves living today, And it is amazing to me that God's truth still remains. God's truth still stands. So given that these and other wrong attitudes toward truth are just openly on display around us every day, we must be making sure that we are showing the right attitudes toward the truth that God has revealed and given to us. So today what we want to do is study here a section of Luke chapter 10. Get this thing on. Luke chapter 10. I guess the TV is not working back there. Uh, That shows us three right attitudes toward truth. So you can see the section that we're going to look at here, beginning at verse 21. The first right attitude toward truth that we see here in Luke chapter 10 is that we need to value God's truth. Read with me here in Luke chapter 10, beginning at verse 21. This is after the section you might remember earlier in the chapter where Jesus has sent the 70 or the 72, depending upon what translation you're reading from, Uh, what we often call the limited commission here, but he has sent them out with the mission to uh, cast out demons, to perform miracles, uh, but also to preach his truth. And they have done that and they come back and they're all excited about the authority, the power they have over Satan's messengers. But Jesus says to them, you need to be more excited that your names are written in heaven So following that conversation, Luke says at verse 21, At that very time he, Jesus, rejoiced greatly in the Holy Spirit and said, I praise you, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for this way was well-pleasing in your sight. 
All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows who the Son is except the Father, and who the Father is except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal himself. Turning to his disciples, he said uh, privately, Blessed are the eyes which see, uh, which see the things you see. For I say to you that many prophets and kings wish to see the things which you see and did not see them, and to hear the things which you hear and did not hear them. As we have just read these few verses, it is obviously at least most of these verses are describing for us, telling us what Jesus was saying as He was talking to His Heavenly Father, His prayer to His Father. On the surface, it may seem that Jesus' prayer to His Heavenly Father may seem kind of strange to us. Why, why was He praising His Father for hiding truth from some people while revealing truth to other people? I mean, as we read through the Scriptures, don't we come to the conclusion that God has revealed His truth to all people? To everyone who wants to hear it, to everyone who wants to see it, to everyone who wants to know it, God has revealed His truth to everyone. He has done that through people. He has revealed His truth through the prophets. He has revealed His truth through the apostles. He revealed His truth, obviously, through His Son, Jesus Christ, being the Word incarnate. He has revealed His will in this book that we call the Bible, the Word of God. Doesn't God want all people to know truth and Certainly He does. There, there are several passages in the New Testament, I think, that would bring this particular truth or point out. I want you to go to 1 Timothy chapter 2. Uh, here, in, uh, as Paul is encouraging and instructing us to uh, pray for all people, but especially in these opening verses to pray for those who are in authority over us as far as our government is concerned. He says to us there at verse 3, This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. God, it is His desire because He is the Father of us all, because in, in a very uh, real sense, maybe not in a unique sense that we're all Christians or we're all children of God in that sense, but as Paul talked about when he was speaking to the people in Athens in Acts 17, we're all children of God, aren't we? And because God is the Father of us all, God desires, notice Paul tells the young preacher here, God desires all people, all men to be saved. He desires all people to come to the knowledge of the truth. So God has given His truth to all people. He desires that everyone would read His truth, would come to know His truth, would believe His truth, would obey His truth, would live His truth out in their life. And yet, as we come back to this statement, this prayer of Jesus here in Luke chapter 10, I believe what He is really saying as He is praying to His Father, as His disciples are listening to His prayer, that the nature of truth, at least God's truth, is such that it will draw some to it, while at the exact same time turning others away from it. And all of that depends upon us. It depends upon the attitude of the receiver of truth, whether this person really values truth or not, whether this is something that is important to them or not. Or, as we said just a moment ago, as we look into our culture and our world today, that there are a lot of people who would deny that it exists, or among those who would say, yes, truth exists, they're really just ignoring it. They don't think it has anything to do with them or their life. But it all depends upon the attitude of the receiver. Do we value truth or not. I want you to think about in Matthew chapter 13. This is just a chapter that is full of kingdom parables, uh, trying, Jesus trying to describe to us in very simple terms uh, what the kingdom of heaven truly is like. But I want you to notice one of these little parables here, the parable of the pearl of great price, verses 45 and 46. Matthew 13, verse 45, beginning again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls, and upon finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. I think Jesus is trying to point out to his audience then and to us that God's truth must be the most valuable treasure that we have. It must be what we are seeking. He says uh, earlier in, in the parable preceding this about the hidden treasure, 
at least in my mind, maybe there's a little bit of a distinction here. I think maybe they're really making the same point. But perhaps the parable of the, the hidden treasure is the man just walking in a field and he kind of stumbles upon that treasure. But here with the pearl of great price, Jesus says to us that it is like a merchant that is seeking fine pearls, that this person is looking for something. He is actively looking for something that is valuable, something that is precious to him. And Jesus is saying when he found that particular that particular pearl that he was looking for, he went and sold everything that he had and bought that one thing. And I believe the point for us in the kingdom of heaven is this, that we need to be willing to sell everything that we have, as it were, everything that might be valuable or precious to us so that we can buy God's truth, so that we can have God's truth and possess it. So God's truth must be the most valuable treasure that we have. But here in this little parable, and I think what in the words of Jesus in the prayer in Luke chapter 10, both of these texts will tell us that those who seek God's truth, they can find it. God, God's truth is not hidden somewhere that we cannot, as His children, find it. It's not some nebulous kind of thing that, that we cannot say, here I have found truth. Those who are seeking God's truth will see it, but those who are not... <laughs> will not see God's truth. And so we, like these disciples that Jesus was speaking to here at Luke chapter 10, notice it wasn't just this prayer to His Father, but verses 20, uh, 23 and 24, Jesus turns to the disciples and He says, You are blessed. Blessed are the eyes which see the things which you see, because there were many who have come before you, and maybe even many that were living then, who had not seen and heard the things that they had seen. So we, like the disciples Jesus is speaking to here, we are blessed. Because we have seen, because we have heard, because we have looked at the evidence, we have examined the evidence for ourselves, we have seen and heard Christ's miracles and His teachings through the pages of Scripture. It is God's Word that shows us those things about our Lord and Savior. So how valuable is God's truth to you? How valuable should God's truth be to all of us? Do we view it as David did? Psalm uh, 119 is a long psalm that just speaks about the, the beauty of the psalmist's relationship with God and, and the beauty of his relationship with God's Word. Uh, but Psalm 19 also talks about that. If you look here in Psalm 19 at verse 7, uh, David says, "...the law of the Lord is perfect." Restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is true, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true. They are righteous altogether. Listen to verse 10 about the Word of God. They are more desirable than gold, yes, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Do we view God's truth as David viewed it? <laughs> I don't know exactly when he wrote this particular psalm. Maybe he was king or maybe he wasn't. But if he was king, think about all the treasures, the earthly possessions he had at his disposal. And yet he said God's truth is more precious, is more valuable than all silver or gold. We, we need to cherish truth. We need to spend time with truth. We need to meditate upon truth. In short, we need to value God's truth. So that's the first attitude we need to have. The second attitude we need to have coming back to our text in Luke chapter 10 is that we need to be people who are living truth. Let's continue reading here beginning at verse 25 in Luke chapter 10. If I can uh, get to the right chapter here. Luke chapter 10 beginning at verse 25. And a lawyer stood up and put him to the test saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, What is written in the law? How does it read to you? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered correctly, do this and you will live. But wishing to justify himself, he said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied and said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among robbers, and they stripped him and beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. And by chance a priest was going down on that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, the Levite also, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. 
But a Samaritan who was on a journey came upon him, and when he saw him, he felt compassion and came to him and bandaged up his wounds, pouring oil and wine on them. And he put him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And on the next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I return, I will repay you. Which of these three do you think proved to be the neighbor, uh, to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the robber's hands? And he said, The one who showed mercy toward him. Then Jesus said to him, Go and do the same. So here is this lawyer as the text presents it to us. He is testing Jesus. Luke says, with this particular question. Nevertheless, Jesus didn't turn away from that. He took this as an opportunity to teach this man truth. He answered this man's question, but he answered his question in a way that probably this lawyer wasn't thinking he was going to answer. He answered, as he often did, with his own questions, and he asked two questions of this man. Number one, or here in verse 26, if you look, Uh, He says, what is written in the law? How does it read to you? Basically, I think Jesus was saying to this lawyer, what does God's truth say, number one? And number two, what does God's truth mean? As a lawyer, of course, uh, Jesus asked him these questions, and he answers correctly. Jesus acknowledges that here at verse 28. But in verse 27, this man knew the law of God. He knew the law of Moses well enough to not just answer, but to quote from God's Word, to quote it to Jesus word for word. However, it wasn't enough for this man just to know what God's Word said. As he was asking Jesus the question, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And again, Jesus turns it back on him and says, what does God's truth say and what does, what does God's truth mean? So it is for us, brothers and sisters and friends, it's not enough for us to just know this book. It's not enough for us to even be able to quote large sections of this book. It's not even enough, as we talked about in the first point here this morning, to say that this book is precious, to to value it, to say that this is a pearl of great price, if you will. We must take it a step further in this second point. We must be people who are applying what we know applying what we say we value to our lives and living it out in our life if we're going to be pleasing to God. I want you to notice here, after stating God's truth on this matter, the lawyer stating the right answer there at verse 27. Notice that Jesus said to him in verse 28, he didn't just say, you've given the right answer, but he said, do this, do this, and you will live. If this man really valued truth, if he really had the attitude toward truth that he was going to live truth, I think the conversation would have stopped right there. But Luke goes on to tell us that this man, he came to Jesus testing him with this question. He was wanting to justify himself, and so he pushes Jesus a little bit further, and he asks, well, who exactly is my neighbor? To which Jesus answered by telling what we know as the parable of the Good Samaritan. We're not going to go through that, that whole parable. I think all of us are familiar enough with that. But I want you to notice at the very last verse we read in this section this morning, as Jesus was asking him the question there, really an application question at uh, verse 36, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the robber's hands? And again, at verse 37, the lawyer gives the right answer. It's the one who showed him mercy. It's the one who showed him compassion. It's the one who showed him love and took care of this man that was in a situation where he couldn't care for himself. He gave the right answer. But notice at the very end of verse 37, Jesus then said to him, Go and do the same. Much like he gave the right answer about what do you need to do to inherit eternal life? Jesus says, yes, that's right, but You need to take it a step further. You need to do. So twice here in just a few verses, Jesus says, do this and you will live. In this parable that Jesus tells of the Good Samaritan, I realize it's a parable. I don't know if it actually happened or not. But Jesus using this Samaritan, I think he was trying to say to this lawyer and to us that this Samaritan not only knew God's truth, but he did God's truth. Here was a man who showed love. Here was a man who showed compassion. Here was a man who took time out of, I'm sure, his busy day and his his focused journey 
and he helped this man in need. So God has revealed his truth to us to live it. Not just to memorize it, not just to quote it. And I'm not saying this morning there's anything wrong with memorizing Scripture. That's a good thing for us to do. There's anything wrong with us quoting Scripture. Uh, we, we had talked recently in, in the Q&A a couple of weeks ago, me and Gavin talked about different bi- biblical translations and went through some of the different translations available today. Uh, and it's very hard if you grew up with one translation, like I grew up from being a kid, the New American Standard, and I just remember verses and sections of Scripture in that particular translation. That's not a bad thing, but if that's as far as our association with God's truth goes, we are falling far short. Because we can be people who quote verse after verse, chapter after chapter, well enough and correctly enough to win any biblical discussion. And yet, if we don't live God's truth, what good has it done for us? Jesus spoke about this. I think he had something to say about this at the very end of probably the greatest sermon ever preached. There, the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7, uh, beginning at verse 24. This is his conclusion to everything he said in this great sermon. Verse 24, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house, and yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house and it fell and great was its fall. I'm sure you have noticed if you, if you have read this section and thought about it much at all throughout your lifetime. But I want you to notice here the, the wise man and the foolish man. Even the, the young ones here know about this particular parable or story illustration that Jesus uses to end this sermon But the wise and the foolish man, Jesus said, both heard. They both heard the word. But what what was the difference between these two people? What was the difference between the result, the consequence of their actions in their life, of of one building his house upon the rock and one building his house upon the sand? He said what made the difference in those two things was whether they did what they heard or not. So hearing without living, I think Jesus is telling us it brings calamity. Just like the house that's built on the sand when the storms of life come, when the waves and the winds are blowing against that house, it's going to fall like a deck of cards. But the one who builds his house upon the rock, that's the person who has heard, obviously, what Jesus had to say. A person who values what Jesus has to say, but also a person who is intent on living. So hearing without living brings calamity. Hearing with living brings safety and security and success. We're not going to take the time to read this passage here. I think many of us are familiar with it from James chapter 1. But there at the end of James chapter 1, James talks to us about how important it is for us to hear God's Word, but also to do God's Word. And the right kind of attitude we need to have as we need to remove all filthiness from our life. We need to remove anger at God maybe when we come to the Word of God. We need to remove all those bad attitudes from us. But he says we need to be not just hearers, but also doers. And he really makes that point, I think drives that point home in verses 26 and 27, when he says, how do you know if you're really living God's Word? How do you know if you're practicing pure and undefiled religion? It's whether you can bridle your tongue, whether you can visit those who are widows and orphans in distress, whether you can keep yourself unstained from the world. All of those things are things to do, ways to live. So James would say what Jesus said at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, hearing without doing results in worthless self-delusion, but hearing with doing results in pure and undefiled religion, which he says the result for ourselves individually is that it will save our souls. So as we learn God's truth, we need to be living God's truth, living it out in our daily lives. Thirdly and finally, very quickly, coming back to Luke chapter 10, we need to be people who are loving God's truth. And I think most of us remember this little account here between Jesus, Mary, and Martha. But let's read it again and think about it for just a few minutes. Verse 38, Now as they were traveling along, he entered a village and a woman named Martha welcomed him, welcomed Jesus into her house. She had a sister called Mary who was seated at the Lord's feet listening to his word. But Martha was distracted with all her preparations and she came up to him and said, Lord, Lord, 
Do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone? Then tell her to help me. But the Lord answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and bothered about so many things, but only one thing is necessary, for Mary has chosen the good part, which shall not be taken away from her. Notice here, verse 38, Martha is the one who welcomed Jesus, the Messiah of God, God in the flesh. She's welcoming Jesus into her home. And yet Jesus says, or Luke rather here says, that she became distracted with all of her preparations for her company. While Mary was sitting at the master's feet, Luke says, listening to his word. Martha was kind of frustrated. She was somewhat perturbed with her sister, and so she asked Jesus, you need to tell my sister to help me. <laughs> I'm doing something important here, and indeed she was doing something important. However, Jesus took this opportunity to, I think, kind of rebuke, even mildly, and told Martha that she was too concerned with all these physical matters. Not that they were wrong in and of themselves, but her sister Mary's chief concern was with spiritual matters. It was with Jesus, He who is the truth, John 14 and verse 6. And with what Jesus was saying. And so it seems to me in verse 42, when Jesus talks about the one thing that is necessary, the one thing that's necessary is love for Jesus, who is the embodiment of God's truth. It is loving truth. And so if that's the attitude that we come with the word to with the word of God, if we love truth, it's going to take precedence over everything else. It will be our top priority in life. From the book of Acts, I'm sure maybe some of your minds are already going to this passage, but Acts chapter 17, uh, as uh, Paul and his traveling companions had preached the gospel there in Thessalonica, there were some who received it and became followers of Jesus Christ, but there were others because of jealousy that pretty much ran them out of town. Uh, verse 10 tells us that the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea, and when they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. Now these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness, examining the Scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. We could definitely say about these people in the city of Berea that they loved truth, didn't they? As we've already spoken of this morning, they were people who valued truth. They were people who were looking for truth. They were seeking truth, because not because they just wanted to have all this knowledge in their head, but because they really wanted to live out God's truth, but it led to them loving God's truth. I think that's evidenced by the time that they spent. They, it says, Luke says, daily they were searching the Scriptures and the way that they received it with great eagerness. It wasn't a chore or a burden to them to say, oh, well, we've got to look into God's truth again today. <laughs> we've got to hear God's truth presented to us again today. No, they were valuing truth and trying to live truth because they loved truth. And also those who became Christians in Thessalonica, I think Luke here telling us in Acts 17 and verse 11 that these in Berea were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica. is talking about the Jews that became jealous, the ones who did not receive the word and, and believe in and obey it. But notice that Paul says something of a, a, a very uh, gives a commendation really here to the, the Christians in Thessalonica in Second Thessalonians or First Thessalonians two and verse thirteen. He says, "For this reason, we also constantly thank God that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but for what it really is, the word of God, which also performs its work in you who believe." Like those good, honest. Brethren in Berea. Paul says the brethren here in Thessalonica, they love God's truth as well. When they heard Paul and Silas and Timothy and maybe others proclaim God's truth, they didn't say, well, an, an apostle, a wise man, had spoken that to us. No, Paul says they received it for what it really was. That it was not man's word. It was not man's truth, but it was God's truth. And so, brothers and sisters and friends, if we love truth, we will value it above all else. And we will live God's truth in our life. So as we live in this environment, which again I don't think is unique to 21st century America, but as we live in this world where there are so many people who have bad attitudes toward truth, let us stand out. <laughs>
Let us be people who value God's truth, are trying to live God's truth, because we really love God's truth. So something for you to think about here the rest of this morning, today, the rest of this week, the rest of our lifetime, really. Do do we really value truth? Are we trying to live truth? And do we truly love truth? Well, let's be dismissed to our classes.